So, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you at today's debate uh, titled What is Melian about external influence in the Western Balkans? My name is Barbara Hrzova, and I'm uh, the manager of the Western Balkans at the Crossroads Project which is run by the Prague Security Studies Institute and supported by the National Endowment for Democracy and within whose framework this debate takes place. Uh, it is already the second debate we are organizing to present the project's main findings uh, as we held a debate on the domestic aspects of foreign influence uh, last Tuesday and you can find it uh, on PSSI Facebook profile. Let me just very briefly introduce the project and I will then give the floor to our colleague Ioannis Armakolas, uh, assistant professor at the University of Macedonia and senior researcher fellow at the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, which you may know just under its abbreviation LIAMEP, uh, also Europe's future fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna and editor in chief of the scientific journal Southeast European and Black Sea Studies, uh, which is published uh, published by Rutledge. And Ioannis was a scientific advisor to the project and, and will moderate a debate. Uh, but first, just a few words about the project. Uh, it was launched in 2018 and has aimed to analyze the role of non-Western external actors in the region and various issues related to their presence. While the first project phase mapped and assessed uh, foreign influence in individual Western Balkan countries in a series of briefing papers, the second phase, whose results are going to be discussed this evening, uh, consists of several case studies and it has aimed to go deeper in bringing understanding of various aspects of foreign influence and presence in the region. We have published 15 analytical studies investigating selected areas and facets of external actors' engagement in the region, which approach the topic from very different perspectives and apply different methods. Uh, the SSI team, which comprised of me and my colleagues Petr Cermak and Anja Grabovac, worked closely with 10 researchers from the region, uh, three of whom we are going to listen to today, and who are the authors of the studies we published. Quality of the papers was also rigorously inspected by, by Ioannis Armaklas, so he's uh, well familiar with everything we are going to talk about this evening. When identifying topics for the two concluding debates, we decided to highlight the domestic or reception side of external actors presence, which was the main theme of last week's event. Uh, and then we decided to focus on the question of harmfulness of foreign influence, as these two issues clearly stand out as crucial aspects of the debate and research of Russian, Chinese, or Turkish influence in the region. But as you will hear, the Western influence uh, must be taken into picture as well. Uh, the question, what is malign about foreign influence has been in fact the guiding question of our project from its very beginning. So we find it very apt topic for the final debate. Uh, it is now my honor to introduce our speakers who contributed to the project with their studies. Uh, the first is Srech Kolatal, a regional editor at the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, who contributed by astonishing three studies for our project. Uh, then we have here Anastas Vangeli, a research fellow at the EU Asia Institute uh, at the ESSCA School of Management and an adjunct professor uh, at its Shang Shanghai campus, who has also currently joined the School of Economics and Business at the University of Ljubljana as a visiting professor. And Anastas contributed with two studies, uh, both China focused. And uh, last but not least, we have here Gente Alamadi, an independent researcher and political analyst uh, from Albania. And before giving floor to Yonis, I would just like to say that those of you who are with us in the Zoom webinar, uh, you can actively participate by asking questions using the Q&A function of Zoom. Uh, you should be able to see it on, on the toolbar uh, at the bottom of the screen. 
and I strongly encourage you to, to post questions as we want to have a vivid debate. Uh, with this saying, I would like to pass word to Ioannis. Thank you, Barbara. Good evening from Athens. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be in this uh, closing event of this excellent project uh, of the Prague uh, Security Studies Institute, which unfortunately was implemented in a very difficult period of the pandemic. Um, I, 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 I must admit that we have left the tough questions for the end, and we have even been provocative with our uh, title of the, of the event, What is Malign About Foreign Influence in the Western Balkans? Uh, but we have three excellent uh, speakers uh, who will talk uh, about the research and the papers that they have published with us. But before we start, um, let me give you a couple of, um, uh, for one minute, uh, maybe the, the concept of today's event. Um, so Russian, Chinese and Turkish influence and activities in the Western Balkans have increasingly been labeled in Western circles as malign. Uh, but uh, viewing the non-Western actors' present, presence and influence as inherently harmful and malign just simplifies a complex reality and does not enable the understanding necessary for increasing the resilience of Western, Western Balkan polities and societies. And at the same time, we should not be oblivious also of the fact that uh, some Western policies may have been harmful also to the uh, process of democratic consolidation in the Western Balkans. Now, our debate today aims to unpack the issue uh, of the harmfulness of uh, foreign activities, primarily, though not exclusively, of Russia, China, and Turkey in the Western Balkans. And we will be asking the following broad questions, and we will try in the end to maybe to answer these questions, although we will have several questions between that. Um, and the questions are, the broad questions are, to which extent where and how does foreign influence cause negative impacts in the Western Balkans? What specifically makes a foreign influence malign? Does it rest on foreign actors' strategy and intentions, or rather in the conduct and interaction with local ruling elites? Does the approach of non-Western actors differ from that of Western countries, and in what ways? And finally, to what extent is foreign non-Western influence harmful to the country's long-term goal of joining the European Union? As Barbara has mentioned, our authors and speakers today have published six uh, papers in the course of the last 12 months. And I think the links will be uh, posted on the chat box so that everybody can access and read these uh, uh, lengthy and very interesting um, reports and studies. And of course, uh, we will have a, a, a bit of an interactive uh, discussion during the first hour. I will try to ask several questions and I will ask our speakers to respond as, uh, as uh, briefly as possible. And in the end, of course, we will have a, um, at least half an hour for the Q&A session. So let me, let me start with Sredsko. And I think, uh, unsurprisingly, we will start with the with a COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Sredsko, to what extent has the COVID-19 pandemic revealed cracks in the system of foreign influences in the region? Uh, can we say if someone, uh, one or more countries have won or others have lost among these foreign actors? Uh, and by the foreign actors here, I don't mean only, uh, of course, non-Western actors, but also Western actors. And do you expect this new situation that has uh, arisen to be detrimental to the region's long-term goal of joining the European Union. So that's what the floor is yours. Thank you, Yanis. Well, um, I mean, I, I would say at the beginning that, that, that the, the cracks uh, in the uh, EU perspective uh, for the Balkan region have appeared uh, yeah. years ago, and they've been growing steadily ever since. Um, and the situation uh, with the COVID-19 have uh, only made them uh, bigger and much more visible. Uh, unfortunately, we today live in the world which, uh, in which everything uh, is being determined by uh, who gets the, 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 the more uh, vaccines uh, sooner. And uh, it's quite clear that in this uh, vaccination race, uh, which is threatening to turn into a vaccination war, uh, there are some clear winners and, and, and clear losers. 
Uh, on the one hand, we see that uh, the COVAX system and, and the EU strategy on the vaccination have apparently failed, or at least they have failed to meet uh, expectations, uh, both uh, within the European Union uh, member countries, but also the Balkans, uh, because uh, all Balkan countries relied 100%, uh, all, all Balkan countries but Serbia, uh, relied exclusively on the EU and WHO-supported uh, uh, COVAX system. And now they are struggling uh, because uh, they are pretty much, they have been left at the end of the line of the European countries uh, in terms of the number of vaccines. On the other hand, uh, we have seen uh, Serbia, which, uh, whose, whose president Aleksandar Vucic has played another magnificent uh, geopolitical uh, game of chess and turned uh, within a few weeks, turned from, from west to east and um, after signing uh, 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 this controversial agreement in Washington in September, uh, he uh, quickly turned around and, and continued negotiating with both uh, Russia and China uh, acquisition of, of their vaccines. And as a result, uh, we are seeing today that Serbia is one of the champions of the vaccination, uh, not only in the Balkans, but uh, also in Europe. And uh, we see that many uh, EU countries, let alone Balkan countries, are now trying to follow this suit. Um, this, of course, will also have serious repercussions uh, for the future uh, of the region uh, and, and therefore also for the future of Europe. But um, I would stop here and, and, and uh, maybe we can talk uh, about these repercussions a little bit later. Well, well, let's, let's, let's talk about the repercussions now because yeah. I think you tackled also my second question by, by focusing on on the strategy of Serbia, which has been different from the rest of the Western Balkan countries, and apparently it's winning. It's a winning strategy, at least for now. So what are the repercussions? I mean, we, we see uh, Serbia's uh, uh, multi, multivalent strategy of, of working with everybody being uh, the clear victor, and uh, those countries that initially relied only on the EU for various reasons, including geopolitical reasons, to start to reconsider. Um, what does that mean? Uh, what are the consequences for the region? Well, I mean, uh, first, it's, it's uh, I mean, the, 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 the conclusion, at least for the time being, is quite clear. And as one of the uh, local officials that I spoke to recently said, uh, trust in the EU doesn't pay off. Uh, openness towards all other resources, whether they're from the East or from, from, from the West, pays off. Uh, so again, uh, by, uh, I mean, th this offers not only a good uh, example of, of what works and, and what doesn't, but um, I would say that uh, Vucic's strategy is, um, I mean, it's, it's really forward-looking. And, and again, it will, I mean, his, uh, his own strategy and, and also its uh, connect connectiveness with, with Russia and China um, will have repercussions on the region because Vucic is not only uh, ordering uh, vaccines from uh, both left, right, and center, but uh, he has, uh, as of recently, uh, conducted uh, negotiations and, and concluded negotiations with both Russian and, and Chinese companies, and he is already starting a production of both Russian and Chinese vaccines in Serbia. So uh, in the world, which again, uh, as we can see, will in the coming months, maybe even years, uh, be uh, dictated by who has uh, vaccines, uh, uh, Serbia, and then uh, countries who are uh, enabling Serbia to produce these vaccines locally and regionally will certainly have advantage. While on the other hand, uh, the, the, the local people across the region um, their frustrations uh, with the, especially with the European Union, which have been uh, accumulating for many years, are now um, you know just proving uh, the point. Thank you, Sletko. Uh, <clears throat> let me move to uh, to Anastas now and, and 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 stay on the same subject of the pandemic. Uh, now, uh, Anastas, in your paper, 
um, which was published by the project and, and, and the link will be posted online very soon. Um, you identify, in fact, three stages in the Western Balkans perception of China or of Western Balkans relations with China during this COVID-19 pandemic. Can you uh, outline for us these stages as, as, as they have been analyzed in the paper and what are their characteristics? And also if you can give us maybe um, some landmark events or landmark developments uh, that uh, uh, de determined the, the, the course of events in, 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 in the different stages. Thank you, Ioannis. Uh, I'm here sharing a, a slide, you know, to just be more kind of visual uh, about it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, my, my research uh, take, took me actually back to the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I think our meeting, last meeting in Belgrade was just briefly before the, the global explosion of, of the coronavirus. So I think we'll have our memories for, from that period anyway. Uh, so in, in those first stages, you know, it, it's very interesting to me actually how throughout that whole year and the perception uh, of China changed dramatically. So, you know, uh, in those first months when we saw uh, uh, the, the outbreak in China, which I dubbed the, the Wuhan stage, uh, where you had all those reports in global media about what was happening in, in Wuhan, you had, you know, those news uh, reverberating in the, in the uh, Balkan uh, media as well and um, in general you know the sentiment then was shock disbelief and, and fear genuine fear from from China I think for a moment if you follow the the discourse back then uh, people for, forgot about all those promises and good relations about China uh, of course this was more at a kind of a popular level that's a media discourse level not so much on an elite level there was some reservation uh, interestingly you know there was no not all, all so much expression of solidarity with China and so on. There was this kind of wait and see approach. Uh, and at the same time, you know, uh, the, the opportunity was not used to, to actually find out more about the disease. Uh, what I uh, found in my research, there was uh, this tendency to kind of also racialize a bit the virus and uh, sensationalize some things, you know, about uh, eating habits of Chinese people and so on. Uh, and of course, those kind of, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, resentment towards Chinese people was not as strong, let's say, as in some other parts of the world where you would, you had basically uh, not just Chinese, but in general, Asian minorities being harassed and so on. Uh, anyway, uh, this, uh, this sentiment rapidly changed as the virus uh, spread globally. And uh, also, just as China was exiting the lockdowns very quickly and, and um, coming out of the you know, uh, that uh, pandemic fighting mode uh, into more kind of, uh, you know, the economic activity returned and China also uh, started to profile itself as an actor contributing to global uh, recovery. And here is, you know, when we came to the so-called mask diplomacy stage. Uh, and uh, what was interesting uh, for me throughout this period, there was kind of a political calculation going on. Uh, on one hand, the Balkan countries were really doing uh, Poorly in the domain of you know having uh, not enough uh, protective equipment, needing ventilators and so on, and all of them received uh, in some uh, form uh, assistance uh, from China. Part of it uh, donation, part of it commercial. But at the same time, you know, because there was this tension in in, in the global discourse about this mass diplomacy, uh, we remember the uh, anxiety in the European Union, uh, also like uh, the the tensions between U.S. and China. Uh, there were efforts to make this, uh, you know, to do this under the radar, of course, with the exception of Serbia, where we all know the famous uh, kind of um, performance by President Vucic, you know, the, the speech about brother Xi Jinping and, and you know, the uh, a big uh, friendship and solidarity between uh, Serbia and China. Uh, and then we come to the vaccine diplomacy stage. Uh, uh, Srečko talked quite a bit in depth about it. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious how the sentiment was changing one more time. So this was kind of the third act uh, in, in this whole uh, year. Uh, of course, with the exception of Serbia, which had this very proactive, very visible attitude of pursuing cooperation with China, securing vaccines early. Uh, it's interesting that at the beginning, there was this 
kind of calculation going on again uh, among other Balkan countries. So you you had the Macedonian government, for instance, uh, trying to to you know when discussing Chinese vaccines to say, well, you know, we are now a NATO country, so maybe we should you know stick with our strategic uh, partners, allies, and try to secure Western vaccines. You know, uh, you had similar things going on in other countries uh, when uh, uh, discussing the Chinese vaccines, but. Over time, as the frustration was building up, as Stretchko mentioned, uh, uh, everyone started to be open to, to doing uh, uh, orders from China. Of course, uh, uh, again, we come to the, the Macedonian case. There was recently a corruption scandal, but that's uh, you know probably to leave it later on for the debate. Uh, in general, uh, I see the trend of history kind of rhyming with how China originally emerged as an actor. I see that potential happening again, uh, starting with the vaccine diplomacy, but also you know, moving on probably to the next stages uh, of let's say post COVID recovery and so on. Uh, I think China has used the vacuum, has used the, uh, the space left behind by, by traditional stakeholders, let's say the EU and the US. And I think it has effectively filled this space. Uh, I hope that uh, answers the question for now, Yanis. Yes, of course. Thank you, Anastasia. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm noting, of course, what you said, that uh, there was some space left for others to fill in, uh, in, in this case, China and uh, in... Uh, and of course, in, Russia. Uh, yeah, in, in, in both the second and the third phase that you nicely uh, outlined, there was a very slow, either slow in the second phase or failed uh, inclusion uh, by the EU of the Western Balkans in, in EU's uh, planning. But we will discuss more about it in a minute. I, I will stay with, with Anastas for now. Uh, maybe we are all hoping to leave uh, the pandemic behind. So I will leave the questions about the pandemic behind for now um, and raise the issue, Anastas, of uh, foreign influence more broadly. And again, focusing on China, since this was the topic, the, 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 the country of of focus of your papers. So in one of your papers um, uh, published by the, uh, the, the project, uh, you argue that we should focus on the, uh, the ideational impact. In other, words, in other words, the impact on ideas uh, that the activity of China in the Western Balkans has brought or will bring in the future. So uh, in your analysis, what is the outcome of this exercise? Um, what are the different types of impact on ideas that China influence or China presence uh, brings and how such impact may change or not the Western Balkan states uh, strategic or geopolitical orientation in the foreseeable future. Right, so uh, I do focus on ideational impact and I argue that it's not, I mean, it is Chinese activity in the region, but also I argue just the emergence of China, uh, you know, and this narrative of the rise of China that is, is uh, you know, uh, spreading globally and has been spreading for years now, and it's only intensifying, in itself changes the context in which uh, actors in the Balkans uh, operate. So I tried to see basically how China arriving to the region and just this whole uh, global uh, chatter about China, how all of that uh, plays into uh, the ways uh, Balkan actors see themselves as part of the world, you know, how they see the changing world and so on. And I tried to distinguish between two criteria. Uh, I tried to see basically to, to what extent there is certain ideational impact go, going on as a result of the increased interactions between uh, Chinese and Balkan actors. Uh, and to what extent uh, there is also ideational impact going on uh, uh, as a result of different processes, uh, namely these debates or debates in the region, you know, something that's exogenous to the interaction between China and the Balkans. And then I also try uh, to see uh, uh, to what extent uh, any ideational impact is a result of the intentions of China and to what extent it's kind of an unintended consequence and even a boomerang effect of the Chinese activity. Uh, so let's say one area where uh, China has been quite successful is to present itself uh, you know, as a partner of the region being embraced on a quite you know, economically liberal terms. Um, uh, again, with a caveat that it's been welcome as a plan B option, as we mentioned earlier, uh, again, going back to, let's say, the, the critical juncture of the global financial crisis when China started uh, to become a more important factor in the region, it's been always, you know, the partner that would fill the void. Um, 
However, you know, there has been uh, unintended consequences. China has been politicized to a certain extent due to uh, controversy shortcomings in the uh, cooperation in like uh, certain projects. Uh, also uh, identify politicization by association. So basically uh, uh, here uh, uh, being associated in, in, in uh, Macedonia being associated with uh, the Gruevsky regime, for instance, uh, uh, brought a lot of negative publicity for China, Chinese projects so that, that carried on uh, later. Today in Serbia, uh, it's impossible to distinguish between China-Serbia cooperation and the rule of Vucic. So many people just by being opposed to Vucic are also being opposed to closer China-Serbia relations. However, I see the biggest kind of uh, uh, unintended consequence uh, in the pol politicization of China with regards to you know, global developments. Uh, so uh, here it's important to understand that throughout the, throughout the development of the relations, both Chinese and Balkan actors have tried to portray their cooperation as somewhat being in isolation of global developments. And Balkan actors, you know, try to, at the same time, you know, embrace China, accept its view of the region and so on, but claim, you know, we are pro, uh, we remain strategically pro-Western and we don't wanna, you know, discuss any big geopolitical issues. And once, you know, there has been these tensions between the US and China, worsening uh, relations between uh, EU and China or frictions in the relations between EU and China, uh, you had an effect on how China was framed in the region. So contrary to, to that kind of attempt to uh, present the cooperation on very pragmatic terms today, it's impossible to talk about China in the region uh, without talking these big geopolitical uh, struggles. Uh, and that is in brief what I have found out. Well, we will return to China, but let me now um, um, uh, give the floor to, to Gentiola and turn uh, to issues of Albania, turn our attention to issues of Albania and Kosovo, uh, which uh, have been the focus, of course, of uh, Gent Gentiola's report. So, uh, uh, Gentiola, I see an apparent, I would say, contradiction in Albania's and Kosovo's intensifying partnership with Turkey in recent years. And Albanians, we know, are the by far the most pro-Western nation in the region. But Turkey in recent years is increasingly being seen as an autonomous actor, sometimes even at odds with Western policies and priorities. And also both Albania and Kosovo ought to undergo extensive democratic reforms as part of the conditionality to join the EU. But at the same time, we know that Turkey is experiencing an authoritarian backsliding in recent years, especially since 2016. Um, is this apparent contradiction only in my mind, or is it understood as such by political elites in Albania or Kosovo or both? Uh, how do they if, they, if they see this as a challenge, how do they respond to this challenge? And it, just to give an example uh, of maybe evidence of this, of this uh, kind of uh, challenging uh, circumstances for Albanian elites, uh, have they experienced the Turkish effort, Turkish state's efforts to have people associated with the ULM movement extradited back to Turkey as undue pressure on Albania and uh, Kosovo and their vulnerable democratic institutions or not? And have they, how has this played out uh, in Albania and Kosovo? Yes, thank you. Um, is first point I would like to just make a distinction between um, the, the the general institutionalized relations between Albania and Turkey and Kosovo and Turkey's countries, and on the other side, we I would put the, the focus on the um, personal level or personal relations that the leaders of the three countries and as in the research focus, it was exactly Rama on, be on, this, on behalf of Albania. It was Sadpachi as a president at that time when the research was conducted and also aired on. So um, there are two different levels on which we would uh, focus on. Uh, um, there is a, an enabling condition that was also analyzed or considered in the paper is the fact that there, the fueling of such relationship in, uh, developed uh, due in, in a moment where uh, the EU stop and go approach uh, has been rather felt. Rama, when Rama came to power, obviously he expected Albania to open the accession negotiations. And after ten, uh, after eight years, we are still talking about it, but nothing has happened in practice. Meanwhile, Kosovo with visa liberalization has also uh, had 
unfortunate, the, the unfortunate des uh, destiny. So in this dynamic environment, uh, there are the po political calculations of the leaders and the fatigue has have made their own, uh, uh, have had their own weight. I would start just linking the, the discourse with my colleagues before on the COVID. Uh, at the end of March, both Rama first and, and Tachi the second declared that they have put a plan C on how to handle the end of the world and, and COVID uh, uh, explosion with this plan C put on the table of the Turkish uh, government. So it was kind of perceived on their side that something good, it was also blackjack at, at that moment that not much was expected to happen on the side of the EU with management of the, the vaccine and so on. And these both these countries were kind of left alone considering that the weight and the relation that Serbia has with Russia and, and then China and, and the other countries. So uh, considering the, that Erdogan has this uh, sh preference for shifting from interstate uh, institutional relations to favoring the one-to-one -one personal relations, blurring therefore the, 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 the line between foreign and domestic affairs, he, his approach was found, um, was found fruitful also to, to both leaders. The, uh, Turkey has not questioned in, in theory uh, the, the democratization and, and the, uh, all the, the reforms, the rule of law in the countries, but has managed to exploit through these personal relations with the leaders, the, 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 the more vulnerabilities that the countries uh, have felt. Obviously the situations are different uh, when uh, considering Albania, Rama has adopted this amb ambivalent approach vis-a-vis -vis Turkey's agenda and his concessions in general uh, to Turkish requests has been rewarded. It is quite a, a transactional relations uh, where the giving in to the Turkish requests are uh, rather limited. I can just mention now uh, that Turkey a few days uh, at the beginning of, of the, the 2021, uh, just declared that they are building a, a, an hospital in Albania as a gift before the election. So it's a gift to, to Rama. In the meantime, Rama responded, uh, recognizing Turkish language now as a language to be taught uh, at school. So these are small details, but in uh, with regards to Gulenism, we have just one single case, and I would say, um, which is a shared opinion also uh, among the media uh, that it was an exchange also in that case for getting more funds from the on the side of Turkey because of the earthquake. And I'm referring here to uh, to the to 2020 um, deportation of one uh, one person. The, the second deportation didn't take place just because the court decided to uh, restart again uh, the, the process. So he's still in Albania. Meanwhile, on the side of Taji, where Kosovo was much more vulnerable. Unfortunately, um, Erdogan has managed to, um, to exploit the vulnerabilities of the country on his own favor and not to have this mutual, uh, mutual empowerment, but giving and taking. And exactly on the case of the deportation of the six uh, Gulen uh, supporters, uh, Tachi decided to, uh, let's say, favor uh, the requests of Erdogan and putting into questions exactly uh, the stability of his own government and creating the break. What I see also uh, important in all this uh, triangulation of brotherhood is the fact that Rama and Tachi had good relation with Erdogan, but in the meantime, they have a good relation among each other, which is not the same context as of today in Kosovo. Because we we might talk even later that uh, Albin Kurdi is completely different relation to Ram and also to to Erdogan. I think I have another question for you on that. So let's leave it for later. So but still, um, another dimension of this Turkish presence and influence in the region uh, has been, of course, religion. Uh, Turkey has been present in. Uh, in the in the Balkans in general uh, forever uh, and uh, especially since the end of communism, but in recent years, of course, the Turkish new influence under Erdogan AKP uh, AK Party uh, has also a religious agenda. Uh, but at the same time, we know that uh, Albanians are probably uh, the only nation in the region that does not have religious overtones in the historical identity narrative uh, and also they it's a three religion a, a, a nation of three religions with with a quite a delicate balance among these religions domestically especially in albania um how does this play out i mean the, 
the religious agenda of, of Erdogan AKP in the Balkans and the sensitivity of the question of religion uh, among Albanians and especially in Albania proper, of course. Yeah, well, uh, definitely, as you said, uh, religion is not, let's say, the most uh, sensitive topic in Albania. Might be in Kosovo uh, perceived as such, but not in the case of Albania, because obviously it's a secular country and, and we coexist um, happily among each other. So uh, the, the, the role, or let's say, the weight of the religious agenda of Turkey has been felt mostly about um, among the, the Albanian Muslim community, because the interference of a foreign country agenda in, in, in the case of Albania has managed to, uh, let's say, split and also paralyze to some extent the relations between the two sides, considering some to certain extent the good and the bad guys. And it was the, the, the losers, let's put it like this, although it might not be the, the, the good word, the appropriate word, is the, the citizens in the case of the, the main mosque in Tirana, because obviously it was created, it was built for the citizens uh, that they want to profess uh, the Muslim religion, but at the same time, they cannot make use of it because uh, that there is this official uh, uh, rupture within the Albanian Muslim community and in practice, the mosque is in the hands of the, um, let's say, the, the Turkish uh, government supporters within the, because it was them who, who founded the, the, the rest. And in, in specific, taking this specific case, I would say that it was perceived mostly that the case of the mosque uh, on the type of the corruption or these uh, non-transparent uh, affairs because uh, the, the model itself or, or the architecture uh, was not uh, selected through uh, a proper um, pro selection process as it was as it was meant to be. Meanwhile, it in in the case of Kosovo, we say we face different societal conditions. I would say, and then on the one hand, Turkish minority is present, so they they had to to delegate uh, elected with members of the parliament. And today, religious is much more practiced, and it, and also the proportionality of religion itself differs from the, uh, from the population in Albania. But on the other side, we have in Kosovo also uh, the civic activism that in Albania miss, is missing. So uh, we can remember uh, in, in July, people protesting in the streets of, of Pristina just because um, the mosque in Pristina, the main mosque was becoming a symbol of the Turkish presence and, and people protesting uh, about it. Meanwhile, in Albania, this, uh, this doesn't happen. So um, I would say that um, what, what Turkey has tried to, uh, to to influence or to achieve with his with its uh, religious agenda is um, a, a plus for for itself in the case probably of Kosovo because the interference there is stronger because the vulnerabilities are higher. Meanwhile, in Albania, the conditions are uh, such as that they, they don't allow. And here, when I say uh, the vulnerability of Kosovo, I would mention also the administ uh, the, the, the former minister Hoxha, uh, minister of foreign affairs in Kosovo who said who admitted that they have had interference to change history books because it starts from religion and then it's it spreads out in other fields that are connected partially directly or indirectly so um i don't know i cannot give a, a proper answer how this would evolve evolve in in, in longer uh, run but um it, it, it's not like it, it, it looks, so it, there might be some uh, breakout, uh, break, breakthrough uh, moments in which the religious agenda of Turkey might even decrease with respect to what have, has happened so far. Thank you, uh, Gentiola. I will return to uh, similar questions in a minute. So Anastas, let, let's le return to, to China for a minute. Um, in your paper for uh, for the project, you focus a lot on discourses, uh, Western Balkan discourses, uh, on uh, about China. Um, so I would like to ask you about uh, specifically Western Balkan actors and the discourses when it comes to China's role and influence in the region. Right, do they thank see you. it as malign? Uh, just to explain a bit more. Or when do they see it as malign? Or do they see it as potentially useful and beneficial? Other actors or uh, the states that have uh, one particular reading of China and others that have a different uh, reading of China, all these things change over time depending on, on circumstances. I think this is a very uh, pertinent question, especially given all this uh, turmoil around pandemic and the role of China. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share, actually, uh, this is a table from the paper, so just you know, to have a visual thing uh, in front of us. So, uh, yeah, I, I tried to take, you know, uh, it just in general, in the study of perceptions of China, there is this notion that there is always this kind of uh, dichotomy going on. Uh, especially, you know, in the Balkans, a very relevant study has been the one by uh, Dragan Pavlicevic uh, discussing uh, opportunity and threat perceptions, which are not always mutually exclusive and they're not fixed and not static. Uh, and I take that, but I, I try to add another layer. I also say, you know, when positioning towards China is not just the interpretation of opportunity or threat, it's also how proactive, how visible, and how much under the radar certain actors are. So in general, I, I try to uh, distinguish between these uh, four kind of uh, ideal types, you know, this kind of active opportunity speaking, uh, seeking. So you would have, for instance, Vucic kind of a paradigmatic actor here. So, you know, not just only proactively participating, uh, but also, you know, being very vocal uh, uh, about China, uh, you know, a lot of uh, platitudes uh, and um, uh, basically also using uh, relationship with China for domestic political uh, goals. Uh, you know, just to 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 boast in front of audience and so on. Um, uh, but then you had also a lot more uh, people throughout the years being kind of opportunity seeking, but in a more cautious way. So you know, kind of utilizing opportunities. So you would have a lot of prime ministers, you know, just showing up to let's say 16, 17 plus one meetings, Belt and Road events. You know, they would not be let's say vocal in support of you know cooperation with China too much outside of that. But you know, over there they would be. Uh, you know, kind of really uh, into the uh, the discourse, uh, you know, this China-led discourse and so on. Um, and and then you know, on the, on the other side also, you would you would have primarily, you know, not so much among the political elite. Now we see in Serbia some opposition leaders being vocally, you know, uh, 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 critical of China. You know, I call that active alarmism. So you, I think you had uh, Gilas uh, with this uh, recent statement. You know. Uh, a survey is becoming a colony of China. Uh, but you have also a lot of this discourse, let's say, among civil society actors, especially those who are closely working with, with Western partners, you know, very kind of ideologically liberal. So they would uh, also import a lot of the criticism uh, on China developed elsewhere, you know, try to link it with, with, with global issues. And uh, then you would also have people who you know, are not really happy with uh, the cooperation with China. They are not necessarily framing China uh, as an opportunity. They see it more, let's say, as a threat, but also not too vocal about it. You know, they don't want to uh, pick up a fight with China or, you know, they just don't want to uh, get embroiled into geopolitical rivalries uh, and so on. And, and that has been very interesting, you know, that positions have changed over time, have evolved over time. Uh, you know, if, if, you know, you had uh, Vujic remaining, let's say, here in the upper left all the time, you would have many people, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Milo Djukanovic in Montenegro, uh, shifting from more kind of opportunistic stance, even so sometimes kind of visible to a more kind of cautious, even alarmist stance. Uh, you would have Zoran Zaev, for instance, in his electoral campaign uh, 2016, you know, listed projects, cooperation with China. First thing he comes into power, you know, after... Uh, a lot of turmoil and a lot of um, also external power plays in Macedonia. So you see him, uh, uh, you know, one of the first things was, you know, to review Chinese projects and then, you know, he hasn't showed up uh, uh, on events and then, uh, you know, uh, then making these statements about, uh, you know, uh, uh, geopolitical struggles around the vaccine and then shifting again, ordering Chinese vaccines. So, you know, positions change, evolve uh, over time. Here is just, you know, uh, uh, how it all played out uh, throughout the pandemic. So uh, uh, you would uh, have basically, uh, again, here we have the shift, let's say, by Zayev, but also, uh, you know, liberal criticism. And uh, again, Vucic being a paradigmatic case of active opportunity seeking. Uh, thank you, Anastas. Uh, let me return to, to Turkey's influence and, and Albania, Kosovo for a minute again, uh, Genta. Um, your paper focuses a lot on the personalities of leaders or rather how leaders are connected at the personal level. So I wonder if this is, a, a, in your view, the determining uh, factor 
in the in this intensification of relations in recent years between Turkey on the one hand, Albania and Kosovo on the other hand. And whether if you would have different leaders at the helm of the two countries, things would look different when it comes to relations with Turkey. We have elections in Albania next month, right? Uh, in a, a bit more than a month's time. I think Rama is probably the favorite to win, but well, it's elections, you never know what would happen if, if he's not um, um, prime minister anymore. And of course we have a, the big, the seismic change in, um, uh, in Kosovo. We have for the first time a, 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 a very powerful prime minister that is not from the old elites, who had been in the past very critical of Turkey's business dealings in Kosovo, especially because of the corruption associated with alleged corruption, corruption associated with some of these deals, which uh, of course were linked to the old elite of Kosovo. But at the same time, of course, Kosovo has been traditionally a very steady uh, supporter of Kosovo independence. So how, how are all these play out? Is it a personality that may change the dynamics or not? Is is more long-term strategic? Um, yeah, well, personal relations and also leaders' personal traits uh, matter in politics, and especially when the main building conditions allow for. So um, in, in this particular uh, cases that we analyze, it is also the, the power interests and money that uh, that matter. Uh, business exchanges have been, uh, some examples have been given also in the paper and exactly through untransparent procedures. And exactly on that, I would point that, uh, that this is the condition that has permitted to the leaders to, to fuel their, or to, to broker, to strengthen their uh, relationship. Um, in, in the case of, uh, of, of, of Albania, obviously Rama and Erdogan have made a lot of uh, business relation together a few days ago, just as, as a simple example. I took the Air Albania for the first time, the flight, uh, which is 49% Turkish and the rest Albanian, and I noticed that uh, when the hostess read the, the, the rules, she said, um, Bayan Larve Beyler said Glitcher Joklar, which means, ladies and gentlemen, dear kids, it's, uh, dear children, it's the only uh, flying company that I have traveled in the past 10 years that, that mentions the kids. It's Turkish Airlines and then it's the, the Albanian. Just to, to say that, that we, uh, we are facing, um, uh, you know, specifically in the case of Albania, all these conditions, the political statement, the, the relinquishing of the mandates uh, of the, the opposition, the paralyzed uh, judicial institutions that have, have allowed for power concentration in, Ra in the Rama's hands. And obviously with his will or with his um, approval, the, the situation with, uh, with Erdogan has gone forward. But I wouldn't say that this has re been reflected in the institutionalization and the reorientation of foreign policy of Albania. In foreign policy in general, in the, the, the past decades, Albania, either leftist or rightist has followed uh, the same priority lines. Um, uh, meanwhile, um, Kurti is quite a different story. He is the face of the new democratic Kosovo, which uh, in the case of Albania wouldn't happen. Uh, in, because obviously Rama is um, a potential winner of the elections of next year, uh, sorry, the next month, but um, he's also well known among the, the, the citizens that he, let's say, blames the opposition during the first mandate for not for fulfilling the promises during this mandate. The justification is uh, the earthquake of 2019 and also the COVID now. So. I need a third mandate in order to fulfill my promises and the people are a bit uh, tired of this. So um, if it was uh, the, the opposition leader in the case of Albania to, to run the country or to win the elections, uh, the, the answer might be uh, yes and no in the sense that um, Berisha and when he was in power, he was quite a, a, a business approach man and with Erdogan, he, he managed to find the common points as political entrepreneurs. Meanwhile, now uh, the democratic uh, alliance is led by a new uh, politician which hasn't taken a clear approach or clear stance towards Turkey. And uh, we don't know to what extent this will um, will affect in general the, the relations. However, I don't expect uh, um, much developments or a comparability in the, with the case of, of Rama. Um, meanwhile, uh, Kurti uh, moving to Kosovo, um, since Pachi is not uh, uh, um, in 
in, in office anymore. Uh, Kurti has had specific uh, uh, orientation towards Erdogan being critical about the investments, the, the management of airport, the power distribution and supply uh, in, in Kosovo. On the other hand, he is finding himself at this specific moment under a specific pressure. And here I would mention either the letter uh, sent by Erdogan a few days ago or the meeting, the specific meeting with the Turkish ambassador in Kosovo that um, reminding him that if you decide to, uh, to to keep the embassy uh, of Kosovo in Jerusalem, then uh, you will have some consequences. And it's it's quite a similar approach to what uh, Erdogan followed also with Haradina some, uh, some years ago. So either with us or against us, the black and white approach that uh, it is also mentioned in the paper that other colleagues from Turkey have analyzed more in detail. So this decision is, is quite important on the side of Erdogan, uh, on the, sorry, on the side of Kurti, just to, to see uh, to what extent he is also going to, to follow the promises or the positioning that he has had while being in opposition and something else when being in, in government, because in the first mandate of, of Kurti, those few uh, weeks that he was in power before, he was much more, at least in the case of the reunion between Kosovo and, and Albania in a single country, he kind of moderated the terms with respect to when he was in position. So there are uh, new developments expected in this regard, and especially on the case of the Kosovo embassy in Jerusalem. Thank, thank you, Kinsola. It's, the, the comparison with Haradina is very interesting, but of course, the, the legitimacy and the popularity of the two leaders is very different. And of course, um, uh, Kurt is also a clean leader. I mean, he's come to be pressured like the previous elites uh, were pressured for various reasons. Uh, now, we, uh, Sretsko, we haven't discussed the Russia much. Um, so for our audience, Sretsko has, uh, has, has published with the project an excellent paper, uh, which is an overview basically uh, of, of various efforts over several many years, in fact, for, to reform the constitutional complex constitutional system of Bosnia. And I urge everybody to read it because it's really explaining a very complicated issue, a uh, very complicated uh, a political problem in, in a very nice way. Uh, now, uh, Sretsko, we are probably uh, about to hear an, a, a new round of, um, um, about a new round of an effort for a, another constitutional reform in Bosnia. And we also hear that maybe the high representative uh, may be changing. Um, all this will need the support of, of Russia one way or another, but the, the geopolitical situation between Russia and the West is not what it used to be. Uh, when, for example, in 2006, uh, you had another effort to reform the uh, constitution of Bosnia. Um, so the, the Russia will not be an easy uh, an easy partner in this case. And, and a, a, another very important development, I think in recent years we see a, a, a clear consolidation of strong partnership and relations between Banja Luka, Republika Srpska and Moscow directly without the intermediate uh, involvement of Belgrade, or this is my impression at least. So what do you think this will play, how this will play out in Bosnia these days? Well, I mean, as, as you said at the beginning, it's, it's, it's very complicated and, and um, I, I will try to keep it simple and to try to keep it uh, regional and global. And anyone who is interested in more details of this complicated issue can, can read my paper. But I mean, just very briefly, uh, Bosnian uh, political and, and electoral system and administrative system has effectively collapsed. I mean, even before uh, the, the, the beginning of the outbreak of, of uh, COVID virus and uh, the, the COVID-19 has uh, made this collapse only more, uh, more visible. Uh, the, the system doesn't function anymore. Uh, services don't really function, at least not uh, properly or at least not as they should for, for, for the citizens. And uh, we, in, 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 in the middle of all this mess, we had the local elections uh, in November and December uh, last year. Uh, and these elections uh, revealed massive election fraud uh, to the point that uh, many, both local and international officials are saying 
that uh, elections in Bosnia Herzegovina doesn't really uh, make any sense anymore unless the uh, the electoral system is changed. Uh, and and now we come to the problem because uh, the electoral system can be changed in 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 many different ways and 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 again in many different directions. And this is where all the local and therefore also all the the the, the global actors go in different and even opposite directions. Um, it seems that Bosnia-Herzegovina is reaching the end uh, of its line, the current road at least, uh, because uh, Bosnian Croat and Bosnian Serb officials uh, have already announced uh, repeatedly that uh, they will block uh, holding of next year's general elections unless the uh, electoral system is reformed. Um, and of course, by uh, doing and saying so, uh, they are focusing on, on, on one side of the story, meaning that they want to uh, bring the electoral system back more towards the original uh, ethnic models. At the same time, we have the situation where Bosniaks uh, want to push uh, the political and administrative system uh, further uh, ahead uh, toward civic models. And right now, there is very uh, ugly, toxic, heated public debate in the country over, uh, over this, this uh, conflict between civic and ethnic uh, models and, and whether civic or even ethnic model exists, since in both cases, uh, they are represented by populist political parties who are mainly focusing on their own uh, party or, or personal interests. But as you said, this uh, critical issue for, for, for the country uh, will bring in all other uh, regional and, and, and foreign actors into this fray. Uh, we al already have a very close uh, participation of Croatia, which uh, has been closely supporting uh, Bosnian Croat leadership in, in, in their positions. Um, taking whatever Bosnian Croat officials were saying um, as, as given and, and not really questioning uh, their motives and, and, and their moves. Um, we have also heard uh, last week uh, from the Bosnian Serb leader, uh, Milora Dodik, uh, at a session of the Republika Srpska National Assembly. He repeated again, uh, this time even more strongly, uh, warning that uh, by the end of his political career, he will uh, definitely move for uh, independence. He will call for uh, a referendum on the independence of Republika Srpska, no matter what. And uh, many, many people close to Dodik uh, uh, think that uh, he is becoming more and more serious uh, because uh, it's, it's, it seems that Bosnian Croat and Bosnian Serb parties will really not allow uh, holding of the next year's elections unless the, uh, the, the election system is changed. Without the elections, <clears throat> many people uh, say that this would be essentially the end of, of uh, Dayton, Bosnia, because regardless of how uh, inefficient and dysfunctional institutions we have today, at least we have institutions. But if, if uh, elections are held in half of the country or are not held at all, uh, then we don't even have institutions. Then we go back to the legal status that existed in 92, um, where uh, Bosniaks will be insisting on Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, Serbs will focus on independence of Republic of Srpska, and Bosnian Croats will be talking about uh, Herzeg Bosna, uh, which is how the war started in, in, in Bosnia in, in 92. Uh, and again, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, this will bring in uh, Russian and American and, and Turkish and, and European uh, influences back into Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's, it's already happening now. And, um, you know, while, while, I mean, as you're talking about Russian influence, um, and, and this um, interesting question of, of which influence is malign and, and which uh, is benign or not. I, I actually wanted to, to offer two, um, two, 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 two um, um, examples. 
um, or one example and one view. Uh, I mean, one example uh, that I want to go back is uh, the situation that existed in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 2016. Uh, it was actually quite similar. It was uh, towards the end of the year when we had uh, local elections and uh, Milorad Dodik actually called for a referendum. It was not referendum on, on independence, uh, but it was referendum on holding of the day of Republika Srpska, which uh, constitutional court uh, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina banned, but Dodik decided to hold it anyway. So he held uh, a referendum uh, in, in late uh, 2016 against the opinion of the international co community, against the opinion of the constitutional court, and interestingly enough, against the opinion of Serbia, because even uh, Serbian President Vucic publicly stated that this was not a, a good idea and that uh, Dodik shouldn't do it. And the only reason why Dodik did it uh, was because Russia, uh, Russia said, well, it's just a public opinion poll. Uh, you know, it's not legally binding, so we don't see why not. So only on the basis of a green light from Russia, uh, Dodik in 2016 was able to uh, hold a referendum uh, on, on, on Day of Republika Srpska. And, uh, and I remember back then uh, that he was really encouraged by the fact that he managed to pull it off. And he started contemplating uh, holding immediately another one, uh, this one on truly on, on, on the independence of Republika Srpska. And what happened then was that uh, in, in December uh, 2016, uh, usually in December, uh, the, the meeting is held of the Peace Implementation Council, this ad hoc body uh, made of representatives of all uh, main international uh, organizations and countries involved in the implementation of peace agreement in Bosnia, including Russia. Uh, and uh, at that time, it was uh, for the first time that the Peace Implementation Council agreed upon statement, Russia included, which uh, clearly stated that neither of the two Bosnian entities have right of secession. And uh, my uh, local and international sources uh, told me back then that this message was also very uh, clearly and strongly passed uh, directly from Moscow to Dodik. And interestingly enough, uh, Dodik uh, completely uh, quieted down and, and, and um, could not be heard for about a month. So I, I wanted to use this example to say that uh, foreign influences in, in Bosnia or in the rest of the Balkans um, are, are often very difficult, difficult to be categorized uh, either as malign or benign. Uh, because uh, primarily they depend on the intention of the foreign influence. And sometimes, uh, 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 you know, one of the foreign influences, they want uh, to block something or they want to move something. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say uh, at the end and, and to probably kind of, you know, um, inspire further debate is that um, in the Balkans, and, and I would say maybe even globally, uh, the, the nature of uh, foreign influence um, depends on the point of view. So, for example, in, in, in the Balkans, um, Russian presence is uh, welcomed by Serbs anywhere, be it in, in Bosnia, be it Montenegro, be it in, in North Macedonia or in Kosovo. Um, and in all these places, uh, most of the Serbs see American presence as seriously malign. Uh, situation is completely different in, from, from the Bosnian perspective, uh, Bosnia or Croat or Albanian uh, perspective, who usually see uh, American uh, presence and influence as uh, very much welcome and Russian uh, as, as, as malign. Uh, I will just conclude with, with the last sentence that uh, over the last couple of years, uh, maybe the only point of agreement uh, among all these uh, different opinions was that uh, European Union influence in the Balkans uh, has been perceived as more and more malign, uh, not because uh, European Union doesn't like us and then they want to hurt us, but simply uh, because uh, they allowed the EU uh, session uh, enlargement perspective to almost completely disappear from the table which has not only uh, opened uh, both doors and windows uh, for all other uh, foreign influences to step in, 
but has also contributed to serious destabilization in the Balkans. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sretsko. Uh, and as you said earlier in the, at the start of our discussion, frustration, frustration about uh, the EU has been growing for years. And I like what you mentioned, or someone told you in an interview, trust in the EU doesn't pay off. And this is very, very, very interesting. And it's, um, I mean, no matter what we think about the EU, and I'm a, I'm a, a pro-European myself, uh, it's important to understand. Uh, it's, important to, it's important <laughs> to understand uh, what the Western Balkans think about the West or the EU these days. And I mean, uh, we shouldn't take the, the uh, allegiance uh, for granted when you have repeated failures, when you have, as you said, a frustration of hopes for like uh, in the near future uh, accession to the EU. But anyway, I think I, I've, I've spoken enough today. Uh, uh, we have many questions. Uh, let's see if we can if we can uh, try to answer uh, all of them uh, in the next in the next uh, twenty five minutes or so. Um, I guess I haven't been notified by our organizers whether they will do it or I will do it. So I will just start and ask questions from read the, read out the questions we have on the on the Q and A box. Um, now, first question, speaking a lot about Russia and China, I wonder in which fields these two actors' actions are, sorry, I, oh, this is gone. <laughs> I lost it. I'll move to the second one. How do citizens in, in Serbia perceive the increasing role of China? What does China's increasing role in the region mean for democracy? Do you citizens are become, uh, do you citizens are, do you see citizens becoming less supportive towards democratic values? Uh, maybe Anastas or Sretsko have an, uh, something to respond, answer this question. Uh, who wants to go first? Anastas, you want to start first? I mean, you've been yeah. working more sure, in China. Sure. sure. Uh, well, uh, I mean, I don't have uh, any recent poll. Uh, but I, I would assume that there is, uh, let's say, on average, probably more uh, positive views of China in Serbia than in other Balkan countries. Um, however, I don't think that's the most interesting question. For me, the most interesting question is always, you know, if we can somehow cross tab, if we have the data. So just to see how it uh, uh, follows along, you know, uh, how it, uh, let's say, what was the distribution in terms of political partisanship. My assumption is that uh, support of the government, let's say, would correlate uh, higher to support with China and, and vice versa. Um, and uh, I think it's also very interesting to see for any kind of uh, regional distributions and so on. I think we often uh, miss that data because actually popular support and popular views are, are quite a complex thing. Uh, what does the uh, increasing role of China region mean for democracy? Uh, I think this is a, a it's kind of complicated to necessarily link uh, China to democracy. And I'll take the example of Serbia following on what I said before. I mean, the problem with democracy, let's say, in Serbia is not necessarily a problem that has to do with China. It's a very kind of internal issue, very deep structural issue. I mean, there has been tons and tons of literature on uh, captured state uh, and, and so on. Um, to me, what is interesting, you know, it's very easy to make that link. Yeah, Vucic has close cooperation with China. And, you know, uh, by then, by, you know, taking this logic into account, you know, China strengthens the Vucic regime and, you know, it's bad for democracy. But the most, the more important point about China is that actually it reaches out to many different actors in the region. So what is probably not very known, actually, the, the political actor that probably has even closer relation or let's say more thorough relation with China and more kind of uh, elaborate relation with China is Vukjeremic, who at the same time happens to be, uh, you know, a fierce, fierce opponent on Vucic and, Vucic and is perceived as a kind of a pro-democracy actor. So uh, I think, you know, it's a, it's a complex uh, question. And uh, the, other, the, the last part of the question was, I think, about, I, I don't think I see, oh yeah, less supportive towards democratic values. Again, what are democratic values? I think, uh, I would try to spin it here to, to, to basically follow uh, upon what Svechko was talking about, the perceptions of the EU. 
because I think a lot, you know, a lot of these ideological issues, liberalism, democracy, and so on, they have been greatly associated uh, with the European Union and, you know, accession to the EU. Uh, and I think there is, I don't think they're becoming necessarily less supportive, but I would say they're becoming more cynical and more ironic. Uh, but also because, you know, um, some of the core problems, especially during the pandemic, yeah, democracy is, is a big problem. The lack of democracy is a problem, right? But it, it, it becomes visible that some of the core problems are not maybe necessarily related to the question of democracy. I mean, economic uh, uh, backwardness is a chronic issue. Uh, the, the lack, you know, the, the decay of uh, institutions, corruption. Yeah, you can link that to democratic development uh, to a certain extent. But, you know, especially when you take in account that you've had non-democratic countries performing so well, you know, China being the, the one example, it's very easy for Balkan uh, population to, you know, get tired with the same stories over and over again and become more cynical about it. So that's why you have something to add? I mean, I, I think that uh, Anastas has uh, pretty much addressed all things. I would just like to underline um, uh, one, 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 one point. Um, the fact is that we live in, in, in at the time of the deep crisis of democracy and deep crisis of neoliberalism. Um, I don't think that either Russia or China have anything to do with that crisis. I think that that crisis has, has been created by countries which have uh, established democracy and neoliberalism and, and then moved away uh, from these principles and used them and misused them for their uh, personal, private, geopolitical, or any other reasons. Uh, so if they want to uh, restore democracy, again, um, you know, they really don't need to do anything to Russia or China. Uh, they should do it uh, by themselves, um, you know, looking inside. Uh, good points, Radesko, thank you. I also, uh, not going into details, reminding everybody of the concept of stabilitocracy that has been developed by our colleagues in Graz. That, that says basically that the EU for over several years, despite whatever China or Russia does, is actually uh, um, uh, privileging uh, stability over democracy in the region, uh, which is, of course, not good for democracy no matter what China or Russia does. Um, I have a, a question. I will try to move back and forth from the various questions so that everybody has a chance to, to answer something. I have a question for, uh, uh, for Gentiola. Um, uh, so the question goes, considering that the influence of Turkey on Albania and Kosovo is mostly a, a result of personal relations between all three political leaders, how stable do you believe it is, given that an increasing number of young voters adopt Western concepts of human rights and are skeptical about Erdogan's internal policy? Do you see a different perception of this influence within the youth? I would add here, especially in Kosovo, because there is a clear division in the voting uh, behavior of young people and, and maybe older generation. Uh, yeah, well, sure. I would. Uh, I was going to start with Kosovo as well, considering that also the population, the young population of Kosovo, with respect to other countries, is higher. Uh, Kosovo, in in the case of the relation between Tachi and and Erdogan, Kosovo youth voted and and they expressed what they want. Their orientation is through uh, rule of law, good governance, democracy, and with this strong uh, uh, vote for uh, Alba, uh, for uh, Albin Kurti, I think that the, the the role of Turkey is uh, is quite limited or absent at least in their intentions when they voted for. Meanwhile, in Albania, the situation is a bit difficult because the the the, the, the internal situation, the political statement, and and the conflict between the parties in Albania has created grounds for Turkey to intervene. And then the personal relations between the two leaders has continued and uh, flourished upon uh, this. Uh, conditions that, uh, that, that they were not so democratic, as I mentioned before, the lack of the constitutional court to certify the elections of last year, uh, or two years ago, sorry, uh, or the, 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 the absence of the opposition in parliament. So the, the leading government has both the local uh, municipalities and also the parliament uh, in its own hands. But on the other hand, uh, even though the position in Albania is quite, um, 
fragmented and not strong enough to provide an alternative to youth. And at the moment, the youth looks about, uh, looks around and tries to, to escape from the country. What I see good or a, a, a new opportunity in the, the, the political uh, environment in Albania is exactly the presence of Ben Bendosi in the elections of 25 of April, because they are, uh, uh, they are participating with candidates in three uh, municipalities, Tirana, Leja and, and Argero Custer. And there we will see uh, if our youngsters are, or the youth is going to vote for this new alternative that ent is entering the, um, into the political space. And I see also some, some resistance on the side of the, the existing political uh, parties and their leaders saying that it's unfair that uh, Albin Kurti is coming for election, electorate uh, campaign in, in Albania and declaring that he's going to vote because he has also an Albanian passport. And obviously his vote is, is for Ved Vendosia. So um, I think that if the political situation in Albania uh, changes and the alliance is not the same, either left or right, and the same political parties exchanging the mandates, sure, the youth will have more possibility. And last year protests uh, have been a sign that um, enough with the status quo, they, they want to, to go forward and Turkey is not the alternative that they consider. Well, uh, I'm reminding everybody that in the last decade or so, we have had uh, youth mobilization in every single country in the region, including the EU member states, but not much political change. Kosovo, yes, maybe North Macedonia, we'll see where this is going. Uh, I have a question from Sretsk to, to Sretsko from Senada Selosabic, uh, our colleague from Zagreb, who was the moderator in the previous uh, workshop last week. So what window of opportunity there is for a meaningful change in BIH in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, in the course of this year before the next elections, let's go. How should the international community react to the last Republika Srpska Assembly conclusions about the OHR, the Office of the High Representative? Well, I mean, um, I, I'm afraid that the window is, is very narrow. Um, I have, over the last uh, few days, had uh, meetings with uh, some of the top American and European officials in, in Bosnia, and I have to say that I've never uh, seen or heard them as worried as, as, as they are now. Um, what, what is especially worrisome is, is the, uh, the, the level of, of uh, ethnic tension and political tension that is present in the media. Uh, media scene, which is uh, which has almost completely gone back uh, to the positions uh, of the war mongering machines uh, that they held in 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 nineties before, during, and after the war, and in this kind of environment where all media or most media and most local uh, academics, intellectuals are screaming at each other, uh, it is almost impossible for local parties. Uh, to take take a step back and and make some uh, concessions, uh, because again, in 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 such a complex country like Bosnia and Herzegovina, this is essentially the only way uh, for for forward. Uh, it is finding some middle solution, some some middle ground. Uh, so once again, I, I think that we are left in the hands of European Union and and and, and USA in the situation where neither uh, Brussels nor Washington are really ready and willing to engage on, on some higher level. So what we are going to see mostly, at least uh, in the next uh, immediate period, in the next uh, few weeks or months, is um, are, or will be diplomatic efforts that will be led mainly at the local level, at the level of, of uh, ambassadors in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And honestly, I'm, I'm not uh, sure that this will cut it because, again, as my paper um, uh, explains and shows, uh, we had a history of at least five uh, different uh, reforms, electoral reforms, that were attempted since 2006 at the times when both US and, and EU presence in Bosnia was much, much, much stronger uh, more positive, more concrete, and more influential than it is today. So, fingers crossed. Uh, thank you, Sretsko. Um, so, uh, maybe a question now for uh, Anastas, which I found somewhere. Now I lost it again. Sorry, apologies for that. 
The brain drain um, one. I think it's a brain drain, but I, I'm trying to find it now. There's many, yeah, okay. So uh, Anastas, how does the exodus to diaspora uh, of, of diaspora brain drain affect the state of things in particular countries in regards to the foreign influence? Are those staying for some reason more, more vulnerable to be manipulated, more disinformed, misinformed, easier to fall for foreign propaganda, no matter what it would be? Uh, typically, we say the more dynamic, younger, better educated people move to, to the West. Uh, does that mean that those that leave behind, uh, uh, stay behind are uh, easier prey? What do you think, Anastas? Well, uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, first, this actually, this is a very uh, interesting question for me, because actually I've been, before I, I, I went to study China and all, I, I was working in Skopje for the Center of Research and Policy Making, and actually I, I've been uh, doing a project on, on, on brain drain like uh, 10 years ago, and then I left the country, right? Uh, but um, uh, the point here is, uh, I don't necessarily think that those who stay behind are, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, less smart, capable. Of, I think it's, it's kind of a, maybe some sort of form of self-discrimination to say that, because there are actually smart people who, who just stay in the country because, uh, you know, they have personal reasons and so on. Uh, also, because I think, you know, uh, the departure uh, of young people from the Western Balkans is not so much framed as a migration and some, you know, kind of, uh, in a very kind of uh, adventurous, you know, seeking better prospects term, it's, it's like evacuation. So, you know, so th that's the sentiment that one gets. And I think those who stay are actually left behind. And I don't think they're left behind to be, you know, uh, necessarily is more easily manipulated and uh, uh, whatnot. I think they're left behind with much less options uh, because we must not forget brain drain. Bottom line is essentially an economic phenomenon. Actually, there was, a, I think by Carnegie, a nice article the other day calculating uh, actually uh, how much the education of all these uh, young uh, enthusiastic people who now uh, live in the EU from the Balkans, how much it has cost the Balkan countries. And, you know, uh, if, if you put a price tag on it, it's also very dramatic and not to say, you know, the opportunity cost, the missed opportunities uh, in, in the Balkans. Uh, so I think they are, uh, it's not that they are, uh, you know, the, the people who are left behind, I, I would say them, because actually, if you see surveys, uh, in, I think in all Balkan countries, the majority of young people want to leave. So that's like the, the mainstream tendency, you know, so those who stay are often seeing themselves as, as, as left behind, you know, and they don't even have that much interest in domestic affairs. They just uh, looking for opportunities abroad very often and so on. So uh, uh, what I was saying is, uh, you know, it's not that they are more easy to manipulate. It's just, you know, the population as such is left, you know, uh, to, to, to witness the decay, the, the disappointments, becomes more ironic, more cynical, you know, very often, actually, you know, you would see locals being angry at the diaspora when the diaspora starts to become too involved in politics saying, okay, you come back, live here, and then tell me how things are, you know, you, you go day, day, day by day uh, facing this, you know, every day, uh, not to use expletive words, uh, and, and then, you know, be the smart guy from abroad with degrees and, and you know, nice job and nice apartment somewhere in Europe or in the US or or elsewhere, and then be the smart one, you know? So uh, uh, in that sense, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think it is this lack of, of, let's say, opportunities in the region and the growing frustration that we've been talking about, it is the uh, uh, actually key factor for, you know, facilitating influence or impact or whatever of uh, external actors. Uh, thank you, Anastas. I, I actually found this very interesting uh, question I was trying to ask in the beginning. And I will ask the question, uh, I will ask the question, sorry, this is my kid. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, whoever thinks uh, he or she can respond. Um, China and Russia, uh, are there are there areas or policy areas or issues in which the interests or policies converge? and areas in which they, they are at odds or enemies, so to say. Uh, can, we, can we discuss this issue? Obviously, 
they're not necessarily they don't necessarily have the exact same agenda not necessarily um, uh, are in coordination in everything so uh, this is a very interesting uh, I think uh, dimension who who would like to I, I see Sretsko nodding do you want to go Sretsko yeah, I mean it's 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 actually quite interesting question, and I'm 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 surprised that it did not pop up uh, sooner or and, and more often. Um, and and my immediate, you know, as I was reading and listening the question, my brain was kind of you know shuffling, 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 and and the only the only area that immediately immediately comes up to my mind where Russia and China have common political agenda is Kosovo. They both uh, have not recognized Kosovo, and they both block uh, Kosovo's uh, recognition uh, outside of the UN Security Council. Uh, but other than that, I think that that so far, at least, Russia and China are completely on different planes, on, on different uh, frequencies, and and they really, uh, it's 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 almost impossible to compare them because Russia is almost completely focused on, on political influence, uh, including given its economic presence, uh, which is most often has at least some uh, political context and, and or is being used for political purposes, while China is completely uh, focused on economy and, and is very pragmatic and ignores uh, most of the uh, quite controversial and problematic uh, Balkan uh, issues because if you look at the Balkan, it's almost like a minefield. I mean, you know, you, you have to know how to navigate all these kind of different issues and sensitivities, et cetera, et cetera, and China just doesn't care. And, and it works for it. Uh, can I follow up on Srečko really quickly? Please, yeah. Uh, so just two points. I think it's, it's also very useful, you know, to zoom out and see China, Russia in a global context. And I mean, I think this is a very often kind of a, a trap for people, not just in the uh, region, but elsewhere, you know, to put them in the same basket. But, you know, the partnership recent between uh, Russia and China has again been very pragmatic and very much a result, you know, of Russia being isolated in the wake of events uh, in Ukraine. And then, you know, uh, being kind of uh, pushed towards more closer cooperation with China. But this is not necessarily a position that uh, Russia likes. And it's not necessarily something that China sees as, as a uh, uh, you know, to to be a long term trend that, you know, investment into some strategic kind of alignment. And when it comes to the Balkans, you know, uh, in some policy areas, it's visible that if not open competition, there is, you know, uh, kind of uh, clear uh, divergence. And I mean, even competition, right? Energy comes to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on one hand, uh, we have clear uh, Russian interest in the energy sector. And on the other hand, we had Chinese investments in different sorts of energy, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of course, uh, thermal power plants, uh, not uh, environmentally sustainable, potentially maybe uh, investments in hydro and potentially other green sources in, in the future. Uh, and when it comes to the vaccines, which we discuss a lot, I mean, Sputnik, Sinopharm, these are competition, right? So mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, you know, it's it. The, the common thing is they're not, uh, either of them uh, for now is not approved in the EU, but you know, these are commercial again, actors, even though, you know, the, the, they have a backing by the state and they, they, they fight for market cap. So it's a- mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anastas. I have taken permission by the organizers to extend our di discussion for a bit longer because we have plenty of very, very good questions. Um, and I will paraphrase so that we move faster. So a question for Gentiola. Russia presence and influence in Albania and Kosovo. One. Second, if I understand the question well, uh, what would undermine Albanian attitudes, mood towards Turkey? What could change the, you know, the good, um, let's say, image that Turkey has among Albanians? Okay. I, I hope I paraphrased well the questions. I'm trying to make it a bit faster now. Starting from the second one, uh, there is um, uh, an opinion poll of uh, one year or so ago uh, from another institute in Albania that uh, analyzed exactly the, the, the role and how the perception of Turkey in Albania. And uh, it comes out that Turkey is not seen as a malign. Actually, it's a provider of security and is our, let's say, friend within NATO. So the, the general attitude 
towards Turkey as a country and, and, and as, a, as a government is, is completely, might be completely different towards the leader uh, of Turkey today that is Erdogan. So um, I, th th there is not this perception as it might be uh, in another country or another leader. Meanwhile, on the Russian influence in Albania and Kosovo, obviously Kosovo, a stretch commands to be elaborated further uh, on the case of Kosovo. Meanwhile, the Russian influence in Albania, I would say that it is uh, quite limited and it was more engaging in, uh, in, in the past uh, year in uh, before COVID, I mean, uh, in, uh, in disinformation. And then there were some, some discussions and debates on, on that point. But on the other side, I would mention also that it was just few weeks ago that the Albanian government ex uh, ex um, excluded another or sent back as, as not grata another uh, Russian diplomat from Albania. So the relations are quite uh, tense in this regard. And there is this cat and, and, and um, mouse game where it was the Russians who offered to the Albanian government uh, some uh, COVID vaccines just to test them in Albania and the Albanian government rejected through uh, this online social media communication. But uh, just last week, the, the governments then changed the approach and, uh, and open, approved uh, a new uh, act on the possibility to explore uh, further the, the possibility to get the, the, the Russian vaccine and, this, and the Chinese vaccine in Albania. So I don't see much of the influence at this point, but. It depends also on how the political situation will evolve because we are now into a, a specific moment in history that Albania might create a new um, opportunity for new leaders, just breaking up with the three, the 30 years of, of the same leaders in, in power or continue with exchanging of uh, the governing uh, opportunities, either left mm -hmm. or right or every two uh, mandates. So. Okay, thank you, Gintiola. Question from... Uh... Uh, Tena Pellets, uh, another uh, uh, participant of this project who spoke last week uh, in the workshop last week for Anastas. Uh, what do you think are the main mi misconceptions uh, uh, of Western discourses on China? And if you can give us scenarios, best case or worst case scenarios uh, about uh, China Western Balkan relations or cooperation in the next 10 years? Right. Well, th thanks to Tena. Uh... She has also very uh, good papers uh, as part of the project. I also would recommend to, to people to also check uh, her work out. Uh, and it's a very good question. I'll, I'll, I'll focus uh, on misconceptions on, on China in the Balkans, you know, because if I start discussing China broadly, we're gonna need another uh, hour to, to, uh, to finish. Uh, so I, I think the main misconception to put it a bit more kind of vulgarly bluntly is that, you know, people often imagine that there is some kind of evil communist apparatchik sitting in Beijing and thinking of like evil plans, how to subvert, you know, uh, Western interests, how to subvert the region and actually, you know, then coming and succeeding at it, uh, uh, which uh, I think, you know, uh, is, is uh, far removed from reality. There's also a misconception that in the China-Balkans relationship, you know, the Balkan countries are this kind of infantile partners without too much agency and, you know, being often uh, confused and abused and uh, so on. And of course, there is the, the double standard uh, also. Uh, and, and all this comes into play, you know, I mean, uh, if uh, uh, you see, I mean, yeah, China is, uh, uh, has a limited understanding of the region and uh, is, uh, has a very different system, different values. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the West still has burgeoning uh, relations with it, despite all tensions, especially the EU, you know, trading daily with China, half a billion uh, euros. Uh, in the Balkans, you know, China seeks to, to deepen interdependence. You know, they try to, to, to become stakeholders. I mean, they wouldn't put so much money, you know, just to manipulate the region. They actually have, you know, once you pour in so much money, even give out loans, you know, you have an interest for those to be paid back, you know, for one to be able to pay back, that there needs to be, you know, some liquidity and some, uh, some, some positive thing happening. Um, and uh, at the same time, you know, China is pretty flexible, is willing to discuss with different stakeholders, is willing to adjust. Uh, of course, it may be tougher, it, there may be, you know, complexities, different interests, but, you know, at the end of the day, all of this uh, is doable. And uh, when we discuss the potential scenarios of, all, of, of how this uh, relationship will play out, 
I, I think it really actually depends on the, on the role of the EU here. Uh, because you cannot uh, see uh, China Balkan relations in isolation, let's say, uh, fr from China EU uh, relations. So, uh, on one hand, you know, we see this trend now in the EU, uh, which is, you know, there is securitization of the relations with China and there is concern, but it's not as nearly as hardcore as in the United States. And we had the moment with a comprehensive agreement on investment being signed, which suggests that there is still, you know, room for. Uh, kind of, uh, uh, let's say, constructive diplomacy and, uh, you know, trying to, to sit on the same table and, and uh, arrange a common agenda. And I think there could be uh, a synergy. You know, I think a lot of the problems in practice uh, with uh, Chinese uh, projects in the region, starting from financial, environmental, sustainability, and so on, you know, are also problems seen in cooperation often with EU actors. Uh, you know, these are not things necessarily that happen only when Balkan countries cooperate with China, you know, the, uh, corruption, lack of due diligence, uh, the lack of capacity of, of, of local actors is a, is a, uh, a generic, uh, I mean, it's a sui generis problem. And um, uh, I think the best case scenario is actually having kind of a constructive approach where, you know, you see China has important resources. It, that's why it has been succeeding because it has been coming, filling an important void. And then you have European actors who have, let's say, more aptness in terms of how to manage things, and they they kind of uh, work together. That would be, of course, the win-win-win, as even some Chinese would say, uh, scenario. The worst case scenario is the Balkans being uh, deeply, deeply embroiled in a kind of a ideological struggle that would assume the EU taking a more kind of uh, uh, confrontational attitude. Uh, in that case, you know, this kind of zero-sum positioning for a region that is so economically backward is uh, uh, also a lose-lose scenario. Uh, that is a uh, long story short, my, my opinion. Okay, uh, Anastas, thank you. Uh, I have a question which I think I will direct to, uh, to Sretsko about a, a, an aspect we haven't discussed at all. It's a question by Nikos Bakidzis. Uh, ra radicalization and violent extremism in the Western Balkans. Can we say that uh, any of these countries that we are discussing, and maybe we include here the Gulf countries, are drivers one way or another of these processes in the region, Sretsko, whether in Bosnia or, or the rest of the Western Balkans? Uh, <clears throat> um, I mean, th this, was, th th this was a concern for, uh, for a number of years in the past. But I think that this also um, has changed with uh, with coronavirus uh, pandemic because uh, the limitations to travel um, are essentially keeping uh, people locked within the countries. And um, you know, so far again, we had very little evidence uh, that Russia is involved in 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 uh, support to extremists. We that they were some concerns about Gulf countries' uh, involvement. But again, um, this has been in the past. Uh, for the past, for the last couple of years, uh, we are hardly hearing anything about it. But, um, you know, to conclude, I think that the biggest problem uh, that the Balkan is facing is internal one. And in, in combination with external conflicts. So to, to kind of uh, uh, catch up on, on one, what Anastas was saying on, on his uh, lose-lose scenario. Uh, in the situation where Balkan countries are inc increasingly uh, confronted with each other and in the situation where their, uh, where their international masters, if I can call it that way, are also confronted, we get this double, uh, you know, wag the dog uh, effect where uh, Balkan countries and, and their conflicts may uh, fuel uh, global tensions and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sretsko. I have a question for Gentiola by Jiri Mehmet, um, and I will try to paraphrase to make it faster. Uh, if if Kos Kosovo, with a specific history, recent history, of uh, uh, difficult, if not worse, uh, uh, period under Milosevic's regime and a struggle for independence, does this kind of history make its politicians and civil society uh, uh, more uh, re resisting outside influence? And what outside influence? Um, Eastern influence, Western influence, 
Christian, yeah. Muslim, secular, whatever. I mean, I guess depends on uh, on which political elites are in power. But this is a very interesting and difficult, I think, uh, question. Um, yes, um, I would uh, I would respond just simply yes in the sense that uh, in Kosovo they appreciate more and they know better, I guess, the uh, value of liberal the value of the being free, taking decision for your own uh, future, and being aware that if you don't find for uh, your modernization of your own country, uh, then you cannot expect it from outside. Unfortunately, in Albania, the situation is more uh, asking uh, or expecting the, other, the others, or particularly the EU, to, to come and, and bring freedom, uh, respect of the freedom uh, in, in general, and also rule of law, and so on and so forth. So the monitoring of the international community in Albania is, it is expected by the citizens because they don't have uh, the courage to, re to get rebels vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the um, traditional politicians. But on the other side, I see, I think that uh, sp speaking about the, the current government and with, with the current, I mean the new one that is going to, to be established soon, it's, uh, the, it's a new perspective and a fresh uh, opportunity that could lead by example uh, for Albania in the case, the case of Kosovo. So uh, this proactiveness, the, the, the right to decide what they want to or where they are uh, aiming at and also to have a more uh, strong um, role for their own the determination of their own future even vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Serbia considering the, the the conflict that they like the resolution of the or normalization of the relations so uh, I think that um, the, the case of Kosovo and the the, the thing that it happens that the elections happen just two months before uh, Albania are are good for Albanians in general and North Macedonia was another good example at least for the Albanians in general to reflect more and to, to, to reappropriate the right to decide for themselves and to, to demand and, and ask for free elections uh, for transparency and then so on and so forth. But um, I have also to be reserved to some extent that sometimes the, the governing elites make, made it make it possible <laughs> not to happen uh, all this ex uh, all this uh, experience or ambition of the citizens because they do have the power and they can manage all the, the cards in order to remain and to keep stability democracy in place and unfortunately we coming back to the international community in Albania so far we have seen that the EU has been um, not quite vocal in ensuring their democracy um, rule of law and, and so on and so forth considering the stalemate that has been taking place in the past two, two years. Thank you, Gentiola. I think you uh, connected uh, to the, um, speaking about the political change in Kosovo and North Macedonia to another question by Zoran Ivanov for whoever wants to respond. Uh, it's a bit of a uh, maybe provocative question, but I think it's very interesting. What is more dangerous for the prosperous, prosperous future of the Western Balkans, the external influence of China and Russia or the uh, uh, incapacity of political establishments uh, in, in the Western Balkan countries to evolve, change, keep up with the dy dynamic changes in the geopolitical environment. I, I, I can imagine what you will answer, given what we have discussed so far, but maybe uh, discuss a bit more the challenge of, um, well, political establishments and, and the, the persistence, the uh, non-reform or whatever you want to call it. Depends, of course, who would you put in on the reform camp these days. Uh, I would say Zayev government, maybe Anastas would disagree, um, but maybe Kosovo for sure. So who wants to, to take this? It's um, our, the people we like to hate, the political elites <laughs> in the region. Anyone? I mean, <clears throat> I, I can very quickly answer. Um, I think that these two sides are kind of intertwining and 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 kind of uh, fueling each other. But uh, I always put responsibility, main part of responsibility, on the local side, uh, because if we know what we want to do and if we do it right, then you know no one else from the outside can really change that. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure whether I would call this incapacity or a lack of political will, because in, in my view, in most cases, although I, I also agree, for example, 
in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, that over the, the past decade, there was a significant drop in the capacity of, of the local politicians to actually produce anything, uh, anything well. Uh, but uh, usually in the first place, it is the, the, the lack of will to, to, to reform, to change, because from the very beginning, um, they were expecting to change in relation to EU enlargement. And then when this carrot disappeared, they just you know, remained uh, where they were and, and then started backsliding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's important to mention that uh, uh, all this is not in vacuum, it's uh, in the context of the disappearing cut carrot of the EU enlargement. Anastas, uh, did you have anything to add here or? Yeah, I mean, since you mentioned, you know, the Zav government, I think it's a very interesting example, for instance, of a, of a government that being over enthusiastic, over zealous, over committed to Western ideals mm -hmm. uh, for its, uh, you know, on, it, on its own detriment and the detriment of the country, you know, so uh, completely, you know, blind uh, to, to anything else that is, I mean, not in terms of geopolitics, you know, the, whatever else happens. And I think, uh, you know, just as probably, uh, you, you know, I mentioned China often being uh, politicized by association, you know, I think governments that are so over zealous, and again, sometimes maybe uh, more in a PR sense rather than substantial stance, but anyway, governments that are so over zealous in, in promoting Western agenda, then also do this service to the Western agenda, because when they become unpopular, you know, people also get fed up with their stories about, uh, you know, EU and so on. Well, we have to. If, if, yeah, if, go if ahead. I go could ahead, just please. jump in. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, because I think this is really very important what Anastas said, because yeah. all of the Balkans was was looking at North uh, North Macedonia, and what Zaev did was, uh, I mean, no one really expected. North Macedonia did what no one really expected they would do. They changed the name of the country uh, to meet uh, expectations, and then they got blocked twice. I mean, first by France and now by, by Bulgaria. And, and this example that the European Union has offered to, 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 to the Balkans is, has, has pretty much killed the, the, the enlargement. Mm -hmm. I mean, what can we expect from Croatia? What can we expect from anyone else uh, you know, if the European Union cannot uh, deal with, with something like this. I, I totally agree. And at the same time, you see Serbia, which is the hard to get country, and which is the hard to get leader in the region, um, still having very good relations with the EU, um, yeah. despite the ambiguous stance, geopolitical ambiguous stance. stance. Um, uh, there is a question about, uh, um, but I think it has been uh, answered already, uh, about the vaccine diplomacy, maybe they mentioned that uh, Sretsko could uh, uh, talk uh, slightly more whether this will have the, well, what we have seen as vaccine diplomacy and the failure of the EU will have uh, effects on the country's EU aspirations, but we have already established that the aspirations are weakening. Yeah. So wh what, what do you think, Sretsko? I mean, I saw the question and, and it's a good one. And uh, the only thing that I would say is that we are still in, in, in the very early phase of, of, of vaccination acquiring process for the Balkans. Uh, so at the moment, I would say that Russia and China are doing everything right. I mean, they're just offering vaccines that no one else is offering. And as, as far as I can see, actually, I saw the news uh, um, half an hour or, 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 or a little bit more ago that European Union is now reconsidering to, to open also talks with uh, Chinese and Russian government. So uh, it's, it's clear that uh, at least at, at this stage, uh, we cannot say that uh, Russian and Chinese vaccination uh, uh, diplomacy is, is malign. I mean, it, they're, they're saving lives if, if vaccines work. Uh, I would rather say that, uh, that that the behavior of some of the pharmaceuticals uh, is is malign in general, but uh, that's something uh, outside of, of, of our scope. You know, but you know, just what I wanted to finish with is uh, remains to be seen what they will do with this. So it's clear that they are now kind of uh, Russia, China, and 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 all other producing countries are kind of carving up the market. So the big question is uh, what they will do once they kind of establish the, 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 
uh, their own markets and, and how will they use it either with prices uh, or, or any other uh, political decisions. But for the time being, um, you know, it's, it's really too early to, to, to talk about uh, any Milan influence. I think with this macroscopic uh, angle by Svetsko, we can uh, close our part of the discussion and then give the floor to, to Barbora for the closing statements. I would like to thank very much Gentiola in Verona, Svetsko in, uh, uh, in, in Sarajevo, my favorite city, and Anastas in Skopje, I think, these days. Uh, thank you very much for the discussion and for our collaboration in the project. And uh, Barbora will, um, well, have the formal closure of the event and the project probably, right? Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Yannis. I won't take much of anyone's time anymore, uh, but I would just like Yannis in thanking Gentiola, Srečka and Anastas for sharing their views and very interesting insights. And Yannis for excellent moderation of the event. It has been a real pleasure cooperating with all of you and also the, the first part of the team who took part in, in the first debate throughout the, the project and listening to you tonight and last week, uh, we made us fully aware of how wonderful team we have had. Uh, but I would also like to thank to the participants for asking very relevant and great questions. And I would like to encourage you to read all the papers that have been discussed today and last week as well as they go really in depth and bring forward some very interesting observations on, on the uh, issues we have discussed and on the topic of external actors presence in, in the region. And you can find all of the publications at the project website, uh, balkancrossroads.com or at Prague Security Studies Institute's uh, website as well. And you can also look forward to a final comprehensive report, which will contain all the studies and also a reflection by Ioannis and Senator Shabic, who was the moderator of the first event. So that just so that you know where to find all the publications we have produced. And thanks everyone for taking part today and wish you a nice rest of the evening. Goodbye. Thanks PSSI for this project. You're welcome. And to Yanis for the moderation and Absolutely. The supervision. Thank you very much also from my side and to uh, PSSI, to all the team and also to the all colleagues that have done a, an amazing work considering also that we never met and we didn't have the opportunity to travel uh, in all the countries of the region. So kudos to all of them. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.